You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach, and welcome to Five Things That Make Life Better. My guest this week is Joyce White Vance, who you know probably from MSNBC. I don't know which came first, that I saw her on TV or that I was following her on Twitter, but in any case, once I became really aware of this smart, sensible, and eminently quotable former United States attorney, Joyce Vance, it was like the chicken and the egg. Which came first? that I knew about her on TV or I knew about her on Twitter. By the way, there's a chicken in the egg about, did I discover MSNBC because of Rachel Maddow or did I discover Rachel Maddow because of MSNBC? Well, let's ponder that another time. Joyce has her own podcast called Hashtag Sisters in Law, good title, with fellow legal experts Jill Wine Banks, Barb McQuaid, and Kimberly Atkins, and they chew on the legal current issues of the day. I think you'll enjoy this conversation because I tried to get to know the woman behind the opinions. I think of her as Southern because she's lived in Alabama with her husband and family for over 30 years, but she's actually a Los Angelina. And then she went to Maine for college and law school in Virginia. She raises chickens with her kids. She knits. She let me see an extraordinary Icelandic sweater she was working on. I offered to buy it. She didn't accept. She's also a professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. Okay, now what are we waiting for? It's time to get to the Oprah, Meghan, and Harry thing. I didn't care at first, then I did care, and then I finally felt like to be part of this world I had to watch, so I did. And boy, was it interesting. Having recently seen the episode of The Crown in which we saw the pre-marriage neglect by the management of the palace of young, really almost pathetic, but young and neglected Diana Spencer when she was engaged to Prince Charles who didn't want to see her or talk to her. My eyes were open to the coldness of the firm or the monarchy LLC. I understand that Meghan Markle has a lot of firsts in her identity and in who she was that would make her forever be an outlier among the stodgy Windsor Mountbatten's, whatever their names are, but I appreciated that they accepted her and what looked to be a real embrace of Meghan at the wedding. As a matter of fact, you all remember because her father wasn't there, Prince Charles walked her down the aisle, which I thought was really kind of touching. With Oprah, I found her credible and beautifully spoken. She said something about, that's a loaded slice of toast, when Oprah told her that the tabloids in England loved that Kate Middleton was eating avocado, but when she herself, Megan, was eating avocado, suddenly she was defenestrating the planet or something. Look, Megan was the victim of a racist and snarky press. That's undeniable. You may disagree with me, but you will not change my mind that she was not allowed to leave the palace to see friends. I get that because she was all over the tabloids, but they could have protected her from the press or made corrections to the press, which it seems they didn't do. She had to surrender her keys and her passport to the office. Sounds like a hotel or worse. I mean, controlled is one thing, but when she needed help, therapeutic medical support, she was denied that because it would look bad. Well, I get it. And I believe that her depression was very real. Harry, to me, seems like a devoted husband, a guy with severe PTSD around the hounding and death of his mother. Good for both of them that they admit that they were overwhelmed with anxiety and sadness and worry. So I'm going to call myself pro Harry and Meghan. And by the way, don't we know that this is just a great opportunity to not think about our lives? by thinking about their lives. I mean, it is a huge distraction this week. So I'm pro them. They gain freedom in this country. It's not like this is not a racist country. Let's just pause and think of that. But they're not being managed by a racist organization or an unfeeling one. Okay, but all this to say what is equally interesting to me is how passionate the bickering. It's beyond bickering on Facebook about, do you believe her or or do you think she's a big fat phony? Of course, she's not fat. 
a lot of people really don't like her or have grown to dislike her. But what I saw on social media, which is why social media is so dangerous, is real, not just tug of war, but angry FUs, you're not my friend anymore, over whether you're pro Megan Harry or anti. I mean, it doesn't really matter. That's the thing. It's a fascinating look. I feel like she may have helped a lot of people by acknowledging her depression. And that's a good takeaway, but it's a crazy world out there. All I would like to know is how did she get better? I think she ought to tell that to people. I hope Oprah asked. Maybe it'll come out in a clip. But was it a combination of therapy and medicine? It would be good to know. Also, I hope she takes care of herself mentally after she gives birth because postpartum depression is real and scary. Okay, before you hear my conversation with Joyce Vance, and I did not ask her about Megan, here are my five things that make life better. Number one, my mother's caregivers. We've been through a tough couple of weeks and they have been exemplary, patient, conscientious. I so appreciate them as I think they know, but I could tell them again. And that's why I said that. Number two, skincare and bonding over skincare. I never learned about it growing up. I was a suntan fiend. I always liked having a tan. My mother never taught me about moisturizing or eye cream or any of that. Whoops. But it so happens that my exhibits and my exhibit-in-law are very into skincare. They're very good about protecting their skin. They all wear sunscreen, even if they stay indoors. And now that I'm forced to look at myself all day on Zooms, and by the way, I hate that, i have becoming much more interested in skincare, and I'd like to make a shout out to Eve Lom. I like that line, Dr. Bader, when I save up. Number three, Dr. Jill Biden. You know why? For being a kind and empathetic woman. She's a first lady, but she's also a real human lady, and that's an appreciative difference. Number four, the tuna salad at Gentile's Fine Food on Madison Avenue. You can buy a little container or many little containers. Long ago, I used to live near their shop. It's a family owned for, I think, since 1926. It's very unusual to have a little family grocery now on Madison Avenue. Anybody who knows New York knows it's a high rent area. And also there are a lot of vacancies, but I used to be addicted to the tuna fish. I always had some at home. You know, the first step in addiction is admitting you have a problem. I moved away, then they moved away, and now they're open at 1118 Madison Avenue. And boy, oh boy, that tuna fish, something special. I mean it. And number five, pajamas. For years, I was all about the nightgown, but I have, for the last year, I guess, or two, just become a total pajama holic. I love it. I know the first step is acknowledging the problem. I just adore a fresh pair of cotton PJs. And this is not pandemic related. I have loved pajamas. I mean, I'm not a copycat on this. On skincare, yes, not on this. I adore a fresh pair. Oh, I love my pajama drawer and short sleeves in the summer, long sleeves in the winter. Is that too much information? Okay, coming up, you won't want to miss Joyce Vance. Well, this is a big day at Five Things That Make Life Better because I have been basically stalking my guest, Joyce Vance, the wonderful, just so eloquent lawyer that you see on MSNBC all the time. I find that I just retweet her constantly, my fingers bleeding. And as you may know, She was the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama and one of the first five U.S. attorneys nominated by President Barack Obama. Today, she teaches at the University of Alabama Law School and is only the mother of four children. 
Welcome, Joyce Vance. Oh, well, and the host and the co-host of Sisters in Law, a wonderful podcast that you host with Jill Weinbanks and Barb McQuaid and Kim Atkins. Yeah. Right. So that keeps you busy. It does. Thank you so much for the um, welcome. I probably don't deserve those many nice words, but the podcast is fun. Longtime fan of your podcast, longtime reader of your preppy handbook many moons ago. But the podcasting thing is fun and it's so enjoyable to have a podcast with my girlfriends where we get to talk about law and politics. It really makes everything else that I do a lot more enjoyable. Well, I must say the podcast revolution was. I don't want to say helped by the former president, because I don't think we're better off for having a lot of podcasts that parsed what he did or complained, in my case, about what he did. But it really had to happen. We had to find ways to connect, particularly during the pandemic. You know, I hope the silver lining of the Trump administration is that people are more engaged and more aggressive about being participants, not just bystanders in democracy. For me as a DOJ lawyer, even when you leave the Justice Department, you never really leave it. You always keep that obligation to help people in the community understand and have confidence when it's warranted in the justice system. So to me, podcasting just feels like part of that ongoing mission. Well, let's talk about how it feels in Alabama. I've been to Alabama numerous times, not in a long time, and I wonder whether your neighbors feel like they are participants and that their voices were heard this year. Alabama is interesting. You know, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Los Angeles, married into a family that was very active in democratic politics. And we live in the city of Birmingham, in the city limits, in a very diverse, progressive neighborhood, lots of doctors, lots of people who are foreign born, who immigrated, So to be honest, you know, you could forget living in the bubble that I live in, that if you drive 20 minutes out, there are people who view the world very differently. Mm -hmm. But in some ways, I find it to be very good to constantly live with and to have friends whose views are different than mine and to be able to have, you know, really civil, respectful conversations about our differences to try to find common ground. I think, you know, that's always been what America is about. It would be boring and certainly impossible if we all agreed with each other about everything. Right. Um, There are some fundamentals where I just don't understand people who disagree, you know, things like the humane treatment of other human beings or ensuring that everybody who's qualified to vote gets to vote. Those seem to be essential, non-debatable propositions for a democracy. But the other issues, issues of policy are always up for debate. And so it's been helpful for me to have to confront other people's views. Now, when you talk about your neighborhood, it sounds like something that wouldn't have existed in Alabama 25 years ago. You know, 25 years ago, this neighborhood looked a lot like how it looks today. Ah. Maybe 35 years ago might be the better analogy. I mean, my father-in-law, who lived in Mountain Brook, which is a wealthy suburb of Birmingham, was disinvited from continued participation in his church's vestry after he hired a black organist in 19, I can't remember the year, 62, 63. So those sentiments obviously still exist among some people as they do in many other states. We're a little bit better known for that. And so I think that there's more of a focus on it down here. I don't think it's limited to Alabama, but we're lucky to have been able to raise our children in a different environment. That's really cool. And let's talk about a woman who was raised in Los Angeles, went to college in Maine. Okay, you were up for changes. We get that. You were adventurous. And then law school in Virginia, and then Birmingham, Alabama. I I, I know you fell in love with an Alabamian. Is that how is that the right term? Alabamian, I guess. Alabamian. Roll tide. Roll tide. Is that okay? Is that okay mm-hmm. to say? We're roll tide. Roll Tide. We were at a wedding. A friend's daughter was marrying an Alabama. And periodically on the dance floor, you would hear Roll Tide. And I just feel like we should be be saying it now. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Very interesting. I got married during football season. There was a lot of roll tide going on. (laughs) At least you didn't get married on an afternoon, I guess. Our wedding, my father-in-law very carefully helped us pick an off time that did not compete with an Alabama football game. Was there tailgating at your wedding? (laughs) <laughs> no, no tailgating. We did have a party that was barbecue and brews with our friends a couple days out, but I was vetoed in my effort to have a barbecue picnic wedding reception. Gotcha. So tell me about your turning into a Southerner, if that's what happened or how it works. You know, I'm not sure you ever really turn into a Southerner. I think the accent is so overwhelming that it that it eats you up. <laughs> um, and it's something that you have to fight against really hard. And sometimes I do a better job of winning that battle than other times. You know, there are a lot of wonderful things about the South, and then there are troubling things about the South. But I've always enjoyed the opportunity to get to know people and to see them as individuals rather than painting with too broad of a brush. Right. Absolutely. And, and, you know, in that sense, it's an amazing place to live. You live with history. And I've had the the privilege and the honor of not just meeting, but getting to know and getting to spend a lot of time in conversation with some of the foot soldiers in the civil rights movement. We're losing more and more of them every year. And so it's been really pretty amazing to have that experience and, and to live that history through their eyes. So that's to me, something that I just couldn't have had any other place. Right. And obviously, you raised your children there, and they are the beneficiaries of that sensitivity as well. You know, I'm not sure if they see it that way. I mean, they sort of hear stories about my misbegotten high school years surfing at Malibu, and they wonder why we're living in a landlocked city. But (laughs) I think they do, in, in some ways, appreciate the experience. Yeah, well... I think we all just think that the way we live is the way one lives. I guess I unless mom right. brags about the Malibu surfing, that that's a whole other thing. <laughs> now, the Department of Justice has gone through a lot of bruising and battering in the last four years. It feels like with a leader like Merrick Garland, things will be restored, honor the independence of the Justice Department, and so forth. But there's a lot of mess to clean up and a lot of appointees who are still there, as I understand. Transitions are always hard. They often take longer than we would like them to take. There are at least two sets of issues. There are substantive issues. There are policies that need to be fixed. Not using consent decrees for police departments that have issues. The immigration prosecution priorities need to be redone. But I think the first challenge that Judge Garland will have to face after he's confirmed is dealing with public confidence in DOJ Mm -hmm. as an institution. Because Mm -hmm. folks in the justice system, criminal and civil, are only able to do their jobs when the public has confidence in them. They make tough calls, you know, sometimes very close tough calls. So people have to believe that they're committed to doing the right thing, not the expedient thing or the political thing or the self-aggrandizing thing. So he will, I think, in a way that no other attorney general has ever had to do. He will have to reach out to the public. He will have to get his new U.S. attorneys and other leaders to reach out to the public and demonstrate good faith and explicitly engage on why people should have confidence in the work that they do. You know, that's what happens when you have a president who spends four years on Twitter taking pot shots at DOJ, at law enforcement, at the intelligence community calling out prosecutors by name when he didn't like their decisions. And similarly, where you have an attorney general, and we had at least one who acts like he's the president's lawyer, not the people's lawyer. And in the face of those criticisms, something that Bill Barr did that I think is really reprehensible is he never responded and took a stand for DOJ. He just doubled down on his position as the president's lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I kept wondering, why is this the flag he wants to plant? Why does he want to die on this mountaintop? I don't know if there's a good answer for that. You know, Bill Barr was always someone who believed in an expansive view of the power of the executive branch of government. Right. But it seems like even if you believed in that expansive view, which was really an outlier's view until 
Barr came to DOJ, that Donald Trump is not the guy you would pick to be your poster child. Correct. And he went further than than he'd ever done before. As you say, the executive branch is one thing, but when you commute Roger Stone's sentence or when you agree to prosecute or defend the president from rape charges and defamation charges that he did before he was the president, what are you saying? And why? DOJ's really proud tradition is to represent the people and to prosecute right. without fear, without favor. And Barr, who I wrote against Barr's confirmation while it was in progress because he had circulated this memo that he wrote where he promised in advance that Trump couldn't be prosecuted. But a lot of people who had worked with him, he was actually the second attorney general that I served under. A lot of people had confidence in him because he had been in DOJ before and they thought that he would at least take a stand for the institution. And that just was not the case. I think someday maybe we'll hear more about what motivated Bill Barr, but it's really hard to, to understand, I think. Well, I agree with that. When you talk about reaching out to Americans to restore faith in the institution, I think that there are two Americas. There's one America that we can talk to, I can talk to, and then there's the whole other America that I don't know that feels very aggrieved that Donald Trump isn't president and believe that, I guess they believe he was the legitimate winner of the election, despite all the numbers and all the recounts. And they believe that, I guess, that Joe Biden stole the election and so on and so forth. And they may believe that COVID is a hoax as well. But how do you reach that group and help them restore their faith in, in our government? Because it feels like they don't get it. Well, I think you have to meet people where they live, and you don't have to take on all of the issues at once. You can have a smaller conversation for starters. You know, I'm reminded of a group I was once invited to speak to early in my time as U.S. attorney. I was invited to speak to an Alabama businessmen's club. And when I showed up, I realized that they took the man in businessman very seriously. <laughs> I was the only uh -huh. woman in the room. And the first question that I was asked came with enormous sympathy from an older gentleman who told me that I seemed like a very nice person who was doing a good job. And he was so sorry that I had to work for Eric Holder, who was then the oh, attorney general. Who wow. He said he must have been a horrible boss. And so I looked at him and I tried to be polite and I think I succeeded. And I explained that Eric Holder was one of my favorite people that I had ever worked for because he set clear standards. And I explained that when I had first talked with him about the job and asked him, you know, what do you want me to do? What should my priorities be? He didn't hesitate. He looked right at me and he said, do the right thing. And I mm. understood what that meant because we had both been at DOJ for a long time. And it meant without fear, without favor, you know, work hard, do the cases that'll help your community the most. Mm -hmm. Don't be a bean counter. Nobody cares how many small cases you indict this month. Do cases that will make your community safer. And so I was able to have just a really genuine conversation in answer to his question. And that enabled me to talk about our priorities at DOJ and the work that we were doing. And I'd like to think that whether they walked out of the room having the same level of respect that I had for Attorney General Holder, that they at least saw the world a little bit differently than they had seen it walking in. And if you'll let me, I'll share one more story. Sure, of course. Early in, in my tenure as U.S. attorney in what seems like a different lifetime, we were still very concerned the top priority at DIJ was foreign terrorism, primarily jihadist terrorism being conducted right. in the U.S. And we realized early on that the U.S. attorneys just weren't engaged with the Muslim community. And so I did some research and found out that we had five mosques in my district also had a very, very large Hindu temple and a Sikh Gurdwara and set out with a few people from my team to go and meet with folks in those communities. And of course, you know, the first mosque that we showed up at, they were suspicious and rightfully so. They wondered what we were doing there. Their mm. contact with DOJ had been with the FBI when the FBI was coming out doing investigative work. 
And so we explain to them, yes, you know, we work with the FBI. We do that same kind of work, but we're here because we don't know you and we're concerned about your civil rights. And we want to talk to you about our civil rights programs, the sorts of problems that you should call and let us help with, you know, civil, civil rights and criminal Mm -hmm. civil rights. And I will tell you that over time, not only did those professional relationships develop very satisfactorily to the point where we felt confident that if they were having problems, they knew us well enough that they would pick up the phone and call us. And they did Mm -hmm. on multiple occasions, but they actually became sustaining personal friendships. And in the last week, I've talked with two of my favorite people from the Birmingham mosque, one about some charitable fundraising in the community, another about a move that she's making and the work she's going to continue doing. And I look back on where we started and I think today about where we are. And I believe that if we engage in good faith with other people with different points of views, we can make progress. We just have to be willing to take that first step. I think you're right. I think we have to be good listeners. I think we have to persuade people that we are there to listen, not to direct them or assault their points of view. And I think one-on-one, it's even better if you can meet someone as a just here I am interested in meeting my neighbor as opposed to I'm wearing a badge and I'm here to intimidate you or I'm wearing a badge so I might intimidate you. You know what I mean? It's very personal. I mean, you say you're you're friends all these years later. It is really important. And one of the guys on my team, not a lawyer, but someone who ran some of our community programs, former Marine, stick straight, wonderful, wonderful guy. We were, I think it was the fourth mosque we visited. We were sitting in a circle talking with folks and he just sort of had a moment and he teared up and he he looked at everybody in the room and he said, you know, when Joyce first said we were going to do this, I thought she was crazy. I was like, yeah, sure. You know, she's the boss. I'll go along and meet whoever she wants me to meet. And he said, you know, I came out of the military. I have learned more in the course of meeting with people in the Muslim community and other faith communities than I ever expected to. And he, and it's like, you know, at this point, everybody in the room is trying to not cry Mm. as he says, you know, this is the most personal growth, not just professional Uh. growth, but personal growth I've ever had. And he said, I'm so grateful to you for welcoming us into your community. And it was at that moment that they realized that they really had. I mean, sure, we could have shown up to be investigators, but they had welcomed us personally. They fed us. They spent time with us. They explained culture and traditions to us. And it was really pretty moving. It sounds very moving. And now our big fear is domestic terrorism. Isn't that incredible? I'm, I'm in Alabama, so that's always been our big fear, much more so than foreign terrorism, because the bookends in our community are the 16th Street church bombing, where four young women died in the early 60s, and the Eric Robert Rudolph bombing um, right. just before my time as a U.S. attorney, where a police officer was killed by a white supremacist terrorist. Yes, I think it's important that we call them that. I mean, the word terrorist sort of belonged to people from other countries and other ethoses, but I feel now that's the word. It's people who push their ideology using violence. I don't think there's any more appropriate word that we could use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a better time than it was in January. It's a better time than it was in December, but this is the week that something's supposed to happen, right? March 4th, something is supposed to rise again? or Well, I think the good thing is that this time law enforcement has good intelligence and is eyes open on the problem and the Capitol will be well defended. And hopefully law enforcement is also look, listening to the chatter about alternative targets. I suspect that the FBI has aggressively activated its resources to have a better intelligence picture of what's going on. And they're certainly working in all of the federal districts across the country, or most of them, there are joint terrorism task forces where FBI and state and locals and other federal agencies meet and pool intelligence and resources. And they're very effective in disrupting events once the intelligence is is there. So I suspect that every FBI special agent in charge in the country has made this his top priority. Yeah, yeah, I would think so. I would think so. I should say his or her because a number yes. of the FBI SACs are women. Absolutely. And you know what? I also think that there's a new patriotism amongst 
regular Americans who saw what happened January 6th and were frightened and appalled and maybe maybe it changed them in some way? You know, in a really, I think, sort of a small, petty way, I mean, I'm not necessarily proud of this, but I was deeply amused by the women who went on some of the dating websites and put up fake profiles and started chatting with guys who'd been at the Capitol on January 6th and then turned them into law enforcement. I thought that was brilliant (laughs) until the dating websites shut it down. Oh, that is fantastic. I didn't even know about that. I'm not proud, but... um, Well, that, I mean, that's ingenious. I would, uh, uh, oh, that's really terrific. Well, Joyce, I know you have a very busy life and I'm very, very conscious of taking up too much of your time, but your list of five things that make your life better is so great, but we have to talk about it. So I want (laughs) to give us time to really understand the things that have sustained you during the shutdown. What do you call it? Do you call it the shutdown or the pandemic or the quarantine or the year that wasn't? Or Yeah, we need a good word for it because quarantine is for people who are actively sick and we've just been proactively staying at home to avoid anyone in our household getting sick because we've got right. um, a kid with a primary immune system disorder. So we have been very restrictive of our activities. Are your four children at home? So children may be giving them too much credit because our baby <laughs> is 18. Uh-huh. One lives around the corner, two are at home, and then one is back at college. Ah, so two at home is a lot of kids at home. It That's is. Pe- the third one is close enough to show up for dinner with some regularity. Ah, excellent. Okay, so let's get to your five things. Your first one was Swedish baked goods. Tell me, <laughs> what are Swedish baked goods? Lingonberry thing? What, s'more so, broad? You know, really all sorts of absolutely wonderful, wonderful things. And the only reason that we learned about things like cardamom and cinnamon buns and princess cake, a cake that's wrapped in marzipan, princess Ooh. tarta, and chocolate boulard, which are chocolate balls, Our daughter was in a school in Sweden and had to come home because of the pandemic. And so she brought home with her all of these amazing recipes and baked for us every day, sometimes more than once a day for the first couple months of the pandemic. Wow. I'm still working off the extra tonnage that I put on, but it was worth every last bite. Oh, wow. I don't even know what those would taste like. But I picture little crepes with berries and a lot of powdered sugar. She did make crepes like that. What I fell in love with was the cardamom flavoring, which I now think that everything, just literally everything is better if it has cardamom in. (laughs) That's cardamom scrambled eggs for you. It's good. Uh, Okay. Number two, chickens. Okay. Now I have a feeling you're talking about living chickens. Living chickens. Yes. Okay. What's the story, Joyce? You are a chicken keeper. My 18 year old, who was then 17, was really good about the pandemic. He understood that he needed to not hang out with his friends and not go to school in order to protect his brother who's immunocompromised. And he he just was stalwart. I was so impressed with his maturity. And at one point, he just sort of said in passing that he wanted to have chickens. And I was so desperate to do nice things to (laughs) sort of make up for what he was missing that I immediately started researching chickens and what kind to get. And our daughter mentioned that she wanted silkies, which is this breed that it's small, it's fluffy and feathery, and they walk like little miniature dinosaurs. If you ever get <laughs> an evolution, looking at these guys walk, you know where dinosaurs you know, evolved to. Right. So we've now got 10 chickens in a really nice coop and a very large, completely fenced and roofed run in our backyard. We sort of had a bottom area that was just scruffy, so it got leveled out, and we put the coop up. And the chickens are great. They now produce eggs, which is very, very cool. But during the late spring months and in summer, where everyone was being so careful, we had space to set up tables and chairs in family groupings that were you know, 10 or 12 feet apart and could sit out there with friends and drink coffee in the morning. And it was pretty wonderful. Oh, nice. And the chickens have changed your life, I think. 
maybe it's just because I'm home. I mean, seriously, you know, who do I have to talk to some days other than the chickens, right? So they're very good listeners and great company. And that's fantastic. Do they have names? They do. They have mm. names. They have personalities. Uh -huh. uh, they have favorite foods. And, and so, I, you know, I sometimes worry. I mean, I'll just be honest and say, I've lived so much in isolation that I worry that whatever minimal social skills I had beforehand have now evaporated uh, and don't uh, see um, anything wrong with it. Well, I don't see anything wrong with it. You're not hurting anybody. They're great. Uh, somebody and it was a I know fun I process. We have a German shepherd and a boxer, and we also have cats. So it was sort of fun integrating oh everybody and convincing them. You know, our, our motto was friends, not food for a very long time. <laughs> so you won't eat the boxer. Okay, got that. But are, are you saying that the dogs and cats and chickens all hang out too? You know, the cat's less so. Occasionally a cat ventures down to the coop, but it's mostly the dogs. And the dogs are down there even when we're not down there. And they've reached the point where they're interested in the chickens. And sometimes, you know, the chickens will talk with them. There's a rare pecking, which is always fun. But mostly the dogs just plop down and, and they're really very good guards when the chickens are free ranging. I don't worry too much about hawks because the dogs are there. Wow. It sounds like a regular farm. I mean, I live in New York City. So for me, it sounds like the wild. It's different for us. I mean, we're such urban city dwellers and the whole backyard chicken movement is a little bit amazing. But we have a number of neighbors who do it too. Now, does that mean you stopped eating chicken? So, you know, from the first time that we got chickens, I developed just real hardship with eating chickens. It really surprised me because you know, we eat a lot of fish, a little bit of red meat, and, and we ate a moderate amount of chicken. And I just lost my taste for it. I now try to eat it every once in a while. I think it would be hard if you're talking to a cousin of a cutlet to <laughs> eat the cutlet. It's enough to turn you into a vegetarian. Yeah, I, I imagine that. Number three, Zoom drinks with your girlfriends. You know, where would we have all been during the pandemic without our girlfriends, right? I mean, it's just Truly. so hard when you can't see people. And so whether it's my friends in Birmingham, in Alabama, or my former U.S. attorney colleagues, having that ability to actually see people and, and lift a glass together has been a lifesaver so many times. Do you have a regular group Zoom drink set up or is it irregular? So I have two groups that are, well, I should say actually three groups that are regular because my breakfast club of women in Birmingham, we've converted to Zoom as well. So regular, but also just irregular as mm -hmm. well. Or, you as know, needed. To celebrate <laughs> special events. Uh -huh. No, I have two regular Zoom calls every week with groups of women and they have sustained me. Absolutely. And you realize you're only talking to the people at home with you, in my case, one person, and you need to tell your stories to somebody else. You need to refine them. <laughs> I think sustaining is the perfect word. You realize how important those friendships are and how much you value people. And I'm so lucky. My best friend from law school married one of my husband's friends from high school. And so wow. they lived pretty close to us. And I think I would have gone stir crazy without the ability to actually see her on Zoom. And even though they live nearby, you see her on Zoom because that's the safest thing you can do. You know, we've seen them in person some. They've been here for coffee. They have like a really huge area in front of their house. So when the weather was nice over the summer and into fall, they had enough space to set up tables that were really far apart so we could eat outside, which for a long time, that was the only thing I went out of my house for was every week or so to go see them for dinner. And of course, we'd all go pick up takeout at a local restaurant that we wanted to make sure survived and you know, right. go there and eat our separate food at our separate tables, which is so crazy because we all cook. We love to cook for each other. It's something that we've done for decades now. And so it felt very sterile to go pick up takeout and get together with your friends who you have a love of food in common with. But, you know, we have to be so responsible. And you're right. Supporting local restaurants has been very important and still very iffy, depending on how much longer this way of life continues. 
Okay, and number four is your German Shepherd. Oh, my sweet puppy, who my husband got me, he said, as a consolation present after Hillary Clinton lost the presidential election. But I think he really just got her because he really wanted a German Shepherd. But she was really happy because All of a sudden, instead of, you know, mom going on business trips for a week at a time and both of us being at work for 10 hours a day, my commute is to Tuscaloosa where I teach. So I'd also be out of the house for 12 hours a day. All of a sudden, we were all there and the Uh kids were all there. And every day, you know, people wanted to take her for a walk and play with her. And I've never seen a dog who was just so happy. I mean, it was every morning she would jump in bed and she would rediscover that everybody was there. And, you know, she'd want to play with you. And you'd be like, Bella, you weigh a hundred pounds, get off of me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And her love, she's just a very sweet, loving, wonderful dog. But she, it's really weird right now. She's not sitting next to me, but I think that's only because we were outside 10 minutes ago and she got soaking wet in the hose. And I think she's been told to stay outside until she's dry again. And she understands, of course, she's a good girl. Um, Yes, sort of. But she, I mean, you know, that's, that was how we spent our life. It was like when you have a two-year-old, you know, and you take pictures and you tell your friends everything they do, and we would be like, <laughs> right. oh, Bella played with the hose today. <laughs> uh, we got a dog around Christmas, a puppy, and I, it has made me, it's wonderful, but it's made me the most boring version of myself I've ever been. Seriously. Absolutely. Oh, I'm such a bore. Number five, family meals. So this involves my husband, me, and our four kids. You know, we started the early part of the pandemic with all four kids essentially under our roof. And then after several months, our our daughter left. But for a long time, it was still us. And look, I mean, my oldest kid who lives a couple blocks away, unless you've got something to do, And he never had anything to do because it was a freaking pandemic and he was going to go home to an empty house. So we had dinner together every night, which was great. Some nights people were in bad moods and picked at each other. And other nights we had fascinating conversations. And as we got closer to the election, you know, some of us were more engaged and some of us were more withdrawn because they feared what was going to happen. But my husband is unbelievable. I think he's now watched every Scandinavian and Korean police procedural (laughs) on Netflix or Amazon Prime. So he was always trying to convince different people to watch with him after dinner. Uh And, And it's nice to have both the time to cook and the time to just have those conversations and and know what's going on in everyone's day. I envy that. My two of my uh, science experiments live in California, so I cannot have that, you know, that, well, I'm a Jewish mother, so I want to feed them and I want to hug them yeah. and I want to um, over insert myself in their lives. Is there anything wrong with that? I mean, it's the Jewish mama way. It's all we know. It's all we know. Well, you are so nice. You are so smart. I will be retweeting you from now till kingdom come. You're going to make me blush. And like you said about women with dogs, I am the most boring version of myself. (laughs) Well, you weren't boring today. And it's nice to get to know the person behind the Chiron on MSNBC. I mean, that, that must get in the way of family dinner sometimes. You know, my husband has become unbelievably flexible. He's done a lot of the cooking. And I'll just say, look, I'm going to hit at some point in the 6 p.m. hour. And he has learned to cook around it. And I give him high marks for that. I agree. Joyce Vance, thank you so, so much for being on the podcast. It's time for me to say you've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest today has been Joyce Aline White Vance. You can find her on Twitter, as I have. You're Joyce Aline on Twitter. And she is just smart and sees things so solidly. And uh, anyway, I'm a big fan. This podcast has been produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Kevin Watkins. My team is Michael Port, Spresso Rucci, Sam Haft, and Boko Haft. Until next week, wear a mask and act natural. (laughs) Bye-bye. 
That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.